Hello and welcome back to another episode of the ever increasingly popular Tanker's View. And today, we're going to look at a tank I've really got no experience in. I've only seen this tank twice before, both times in war museums, and both times they looked kind of wildly different. Once in Munster, Germany, and the other time in Ottawa, my nation's capital. Now, the first time I laid eyes on this thing, I remember thinking, dang, it looks different. Both futuristic, yet kind of somehow familiar. But we're going to take a look at the Merkaba today and see if it stacks up to all the hype, or if I'm just viewing this through sand-colored lenses. Okay, so before I begin, I want to thank each and every one of you for subbing lately. You know the old refrain, be the change you want to see. You want to see more of me? Change that by hitting the sub button, tossing me a thumbs up, leave me a comment, and unless you're a twat waffle, you'll probably get a thumbs up from me. Maybe even a comment. I do try to read them all, and I'll be honest, it was a lot easier when I had a lot less subs, but I didn't expect this channel to blow up like it did. Any hoodle, moving on from my own self-serving needs here, I'm going to focus on some needs of propriety. This is not going to be a political video. I will not discuss politics or foreign policy or anything like that. It's not my bag, it's not my wheelhouse, and I am no good at it. So, and it's not why you're all here. We're only going to look at the Merkaba tank from the view of a tanker of a different nation. And you know, as the old army saying goes, I'm going to stay in my lane on this one as much as possible. And with that being said, I will be mentioning things that the Israeli Defense Force has stated in reference to the Merkaba. This is neither an endorsement nor an indictment of their policy, only a statement of the producers of the vehicles. So with my very obvious fence sitting and culpability statements out of the way, let's look at this beast. The Merkaba, or Merkaba, as Google Translate has just now taught me to say it, I will apologize now, but the Northwestern accent I possess does not lend well to producing Hebrew words well. This was made very obvious to me when I was taught by some lovely IDF instructors on the PSS system that the Canadian Armed Forces had acquired, but that's a story for another time. This video will be broken into several sections, nor will it be exhaustive, and you can choose to watch them in order or not. Either way, I put the chapters down below, and this is just going to be my general overview from somebody the outside looking in. Next is going to be specs, history, and finally its future. So this is meant to be a general overview of how I think this tank is. Or am I going to show it side by side with the difference between them, Western, and Soviet tanks? Because, well, the Merkava is kind of really something different and unique. Now, I'm willing to accept that no tank is perfect. Hell, they've all got very exploitable flaws. In training, we were taught how to exploit those flaws. It's very simply a matter of which nation decides to prioritize what when building and designing them. Now, obviously, I'm going to point out some of its things that I think are fantastic, and other that are glaring weaknesses. Now, right off the hop, that the Merkava is not like any tank that's ever been built before. It wasn't meant to challenge hordes of Soviet tanks in the Fulda Gap on the plains of Europe. It was designed and produced by a nation that was quite literally surrounded by its enemies. And it took into account the terrain it would face, what its supply lines may look like, the enemies it would face, and the very real fact that the most expensive part of any tank warfare is competent crews. So keeping them alive and healthy was high priority especially with so few trained tank crews. So looking at the Merkava from the outside, I'm obviously going to start with the Mark I. We can see several things right away. Now, this girl's got some beautiful curves and a mantleless gun, very reminiscent of the Chieftain, which I believe this might have been partially based on. I believe there was some collaboration sometime around that area. I'm not entirely sure, but I'm sure someone will correct me in the comments. Now, its drive sprocket is the front, which indicates that its engine is actually in the bow. Now this is kind of really uncommon with main battle tanks as they tend to put their engines in the rear. Now, less so in infantry fighting vehicles where the engine tends to act as additional armor for the crew. Now, the track you'll see is hard steel with no track pads and this is to be expected. The terrain that these are deployed in would be ruinous on track pads. The gaps in the track would also allow for the material to shed, preventing buildup that would cause thrown track or broken legs. Every driver's annoyance. And now, the IDF has been on record as saying crew survivability is paramount in its design. And well, well, everything here would seem to indicate that that is the case. From the angles of the armor for hull down ops, the reduction of the exposure of the turret ring to an absolute minimum, and actually taking into account what the tank crews have said and implementing it. And here in the rear, we also see a hatch for the crew to enter or exit or to store infantry and ammunition. Something that's also not found on any other tank that I'm aware of. And if anyone can think, please let me know in the comments down below. Google didn't help me out on this one, and neither did any of my textbooks. The Mark IIs and III saw improvements to the exteriors with the application of chain netting around the turret bustle, 
reducing the danger of the Merkava's few blindingly obvious weaknesses and shot traps, which realistically are the same weaknesses that most main battle tanks have. The turret ring, the rear flanks, etc. There was also a lot of internal component changes and the addition of applique armor to the tank. And also most notably, the 2-inch mortar system was installed internally, as opposed to letting the tank's mortar men drop steel rain with their ass hanging out in the open. Now the Mark III is where people's minds tend to go when they think Merkava tank, and it really is the next evolution of their solid design, constantly retrofitted and upgraded to maintain lethality as their, adversary, as their adversary's firepower increased. And the Mark IV, oh boy, oh boy. Low, sloping, wide body, looking like a predator waiting to pounce. In terms of, in, in terms of intimidation factor, yeah, it's got it. While the Mark IV may look more Soviet than one might imagine a Western tank, that kind of really is a real reason for this. And I can't believe I have to say it, and the commies are going to clip this out of context, but Soviet, era but Soviet era tanks actually weren't that bad in the way of armor design sometimes. If built to spec, this wasn't always the case, and that's the exception, not the rule. Okay? There's a reason it took the combined intellectual might of the West to try and counter them, as much as we may not want to admit it. The low profile turret and the acute slope of the armor gives crews an added degree of tactical flexibility against incoming first strikes against them is just going to glance off. It's not guaranteed, but if it increases the chances from 0% to say 15 or 20%, it's still going to give the crew the warm and fuzzies they got a 1 in 5 chance of packing it out. This tank has also seen the successful and tested integration of several revolutionary technologies which can be seen on the exterior. Most obvious being the Trophy Active Protection System Sensor Suite, the deletion of the loader's hatch, and the addition of the Commander's HK Parry. Now before y'all zip our heads, pause this video to give me the gears, I am well aware that these technologies were present on the Mark III as well, but usually on a prototyping, trial, or bolt-on basis. Think Abrams Set B3 or Challenger 2 TES Lethal uh, LEP Plus program but the Mark IV is where they were fully integrated as part of the production process. I should probably move on to specs now before I get any more carried away, and look at this, we're gonna naturally scoot right into it. To begin, I would like to note that there are four production marks the Merkava, as I've already stated, but only really two categories. The Mark I and the improved version of the Mark II sitting in the second generation evolution, and the Mark III and Mark IV sitting firmly ensconced in third generation. The Mark I was developed in the 70s and made operational by 1979 with a cool 901 horsepower at 61 tons and a 105mm rifled gun welded in cast spaced armor. Essentially making this the Middle Eastern equivalent to the Chieftain Leopard or M60. Now it was a comparable second generation tank built by a nation to which at that point had no domestic tank production and was pulled off in less than a decade, even with Western help. That's a remarkable feat of engineering and production. The Mark II took many of the improvements pointed out by the tank crews in the 1982 Lebanon War and that were just added onto the Mark I and included it in the production process. This included an upgraded power pack, applique armor, putting that 2 inch mortar inside the turret. It also received several minor upgrades to the fire control system. Although I will state several of these upgrades are uncooperated and for example I couldn't find any mention of what the thermals were upgraded to despite the fact they say it had thermals added. The Mark III is where the Merkava really comes into its own. As of this date, this is the most widely produced version of the tank as well as the most widely upgraded. It was upgraded to third generation standards and its weight was still clocking in at roughly 63.5 tons compared to the 61 and the 62 of the Mark I's and II respectively. It was also the last mark to use dual coil compression springs. I don't know why they chose to go with this over torsion bar. Uh, there's been several theories, but no one seems to again want to agree on this. And if someone can actually point out an article where they state this, please tell me in the comments down below. Because at the time of recording this, with the week of research I had done, I could not find it. Upgrades included a better power pack, additional armor, remote weapon system mounts, 120 millimeter smoothbore gun, trophy APS, the elimination of the side lo or elimination of the loader's hatch and stealthing features slowly added over time to decrease its thermal and radar signature due to the proliferation of cheaper anti-tank guided missiles. The Mark IV took everything that was the Mark III and integrated it straight into its build, increasing interoperability with its other units and reducing supply line burden. If you wonder what I mean by this, it's that the equipment was already integrated as part of the structure 
as opposed to bolt on. It's less likely to receive accidental damage. Like I've said before, tankers are notoriously hard on their equipment. The power pack was increased from 1200 to 1500 and air conditioners are included with this thing. Now hold up, quick aside, how is it the only nations to put AC in their tanks are the Israelis and the French? Are they onto something the rest of us aren't aware of? Oh right, it's <coughs> hot in the desert and AC is a must. Notice to NATO on that one. The gun was also upgraded to allow for the firing of missiles from it and a broader rate of standard 120mm ammunition. I really don't know how hard that missile is on the barrel of the gun, they won't say, but I would imagine it would probably be negligible as long as the missiles aren't fired at a rapid fire pace out of the gun. Now politics aside, the Merkava is a battle tested design. It has been involved in every conflict fought by the IDF since 1982. It's taken its licks and given quite a few back, making the world stand up and take notice. Now like I said, I'm not going to comment on the political ramifications of these wars. Each iteration has been improving, made in reaction to evolving threats from the tank crews. Now, older marks, even older marks are finding new life as Mark IIs are being converted into IFBs and ambulances. The Mark IV is due to an upgrade. Uh, the Mark IV itself is due for an upgrade starting in 2023 with upgraded APS, 100 killer parry, and the introduction of augmented reality helmets for the crew, a la F-35, which apparently the IDF developed. And augmented reality is a first as far as I'm aware for any production tank and it will be interesting to see how in the future that was received by the crews themselves. Anyway guys, that's all for this video. Thanks for coming out. If you enjoyed this content, feel free to give me a thumbs up, subscribe, maybe leave a comment down below. And with that, I will see you on the next one guys.